Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing really well. So today we are back to do my November wrap up part two. And before we get into the books, I do have to briefly apologize for the lighting situation. This is what I get for trying to film a video at three o'clock in the afternoon on a December day. As you might be able to tell from the light behind me, light is currently streaming into this room. And the only way that I've been able to get this so that I am not completely overexposed is by hanging a towel up on my blinds. You know, just good winter fun. And I'm really hoping that this towel does not fall down. Such great professional content you from me. At the end of November I felt like I was reading a lot but when I'm actually looking at the pile of books that I've finished it doesn't seem like that much and I think part of that is because three of the books that I finished were children's books which is quite a rarity for me. I don't usually read like children's picture books but a few things just found their way to me this month. So first off kind of linking on to one of the books that I read in my November wrap-up part one is Clarice Bean. My uncle is a hunkle by Lauren Child. Yes so as you may know I read Clarice Bean Think Like an Elf which is the new Clarice Bean novel and I loved it. It reminded me of how much I loved the Clarice Bean books when I was a kid, but this was actually one that I had never read before. And so when I found it in a charity shop, just coincidentally, I had to snap it up. And this was just good fun. In this little picture book, Clarice Bean's parents have to go to America unexpectedly. And so her mother decides to leave her brother, Ted, in charge. And Uncle Ted is not the most responsible of men, but he's very charismatic, very fun to be around. And so it's all about the different hijinks that Uncle Ted and Clarice and her siblings get up to whilst the parents are away. And yeah, if you've got little ones, I think this would just be good fun. A sad reminder that I am nowhere near as cool and fun and ant as Uncle Ted is, but you know, we, we, can, we strive. On the same trip to the charity shop, I found Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, which is just a stunning picture book recounting the history of Charles Darwin and his thoughts on evolution. And it's just beautifully, beautifully illustrated. I feel like if I was a little kid, I'd be so intrigued by this, really drawn in by the writing and by the beautiful imagery. And I think this is just a really great way of getting children more into science, more into zoology and natural history. I like that it doesn't just focus in on the theory of evolution itself, it also so goes into Charles Darwin and his life and his family. Yeah, I think this is just really fun and informative and I would definitely give this to like a little primary school child. The next one that I want to show you is I suppose more on the graphic novel side of things, but definitely one that you could give to children. It's kind of straddling the line between graphic novel and picture book. And that is Athena, the story of a goddess by Imogen and Isabel Greenberg, who you might also know wrote The 100 Nights of Hero or Glass Town, which was all about the Brontes. Two graphic novels that I haven't read, but I would really like to get to. This on the other hand recounts the story story of Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war. Look how stunning this front cover is! And the inside is equally as beautiful. Just going into all the mythology surrounding Athena, all the trials and tribulations, all of the mischief that she got up to. What I really like about this is that it clearly sees Athena as somebody inspirational, but also doesn't shy away from the negative aspects of her character, the bad things that she does. That being said, one of the criticisms that I would say about this is maybe because it is a children's book, it doesn't go in depth on the majority Medusa myth as I would like and especially Athena's role in Medusa's fate. Once again I do understand that this is intended as a children's book and there are certain topics particularly with the Medusa myth that are really hard to kind of pass out how you deal with that with children but I feel like this book was doing so well in kind of complicating Athena's character that this seemed like a glaring omission but aside from that quibble that I did have with that I think this is absolutely stunning and I feel like this would be a really fun introduction to Greek myth or maybe a continuation for example if you have a child who's read the DK Greek myth by Jean Menias. I really like Athena as a figure in Greek myth, so I've been wanting to pick this up for a while and I'm really really glad that I finally did. Have a sip of tea. Do you like my mug? It's just got lots of different Elizabeth firsts on it. And now getting into the non-picture books that I read this month. Firstly, we have the November pick for the I Should Have Read That book club, which was The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. If you'd like to see more of my full thoughts about this book, then I will definitely link for you the live stream that I did over on Shannon from 155 Books channel. We had a really, really good discussion on this. This was a reread for me. I believe it also was for Shannon. And I have to say, I think this improved for me on a reread, which is what I thought would happen. Of course, this story follows the life of the young, vain Dorian Gray who has his portrait painted for him by his friend Basil Hayward. And whilst Basil is painting his portrait, he is introduced to Lord Henry, who becomes quite a corruptive influence on Dorian. Lord Henry encourages him to embrace his more hedonistic side, to live only for himself, and to partake in all of life's pleasures, kind of regardless of the effect that it will have on other people. He flatters Dorian, he tells him how beautiful he is, how young and full of life he is, and how he must make the most of that. And when Basil the painter reveals the portrait that he has painted of Dorian, 
Dorian is distressed, looking at this beautiful portrait of himself and realising that this portrait will always stay young, whereas he, Dorian the man, is going to age, and he will never be more beautiful than he is in this moment. In his distress, he says aloud his wish that he could stay young and beautiful forever, but the portrait would grow old. And everyone kind of bats this aside and says, don't be silly, Dorian, and they start to get on with their lives. Basil and Dorian starting to drift apart, and Dorian becoming more entwined with Lord Henry, starts to embrace this path of hedonism and only looking out for himself, basically being rather a cruel person, letting his most selfish impulses take hold of him. And as we start to learn through the course of the book, Dorian's original wish has come true. When he goes back to the portrait that Basil painted of him, it does seem as if the portrait is growing older and is starting to look more cruel, while Dorian himself does not seem to be aging. And we follow the next 20 years, where Dorian spirals even more into this lifestyle. And yeah, I feel like this hit me even more the second time reading it, especially the beautiful writing in here. This writing is just sumptuous. And I was saying to Shannon, I'm not really any big fan of like beautiful lyrical writing. I feel like this kind of it's at the edge of what I like, where it is beautiful and it is kind of flowery, but I think it really suits the subject matter, which is all about beauty and the lengths that we strive for beauty. It is a book that is a lot about language and art, so the fact that it has such beautiful writing just kind of fits in a way that doesn't feel very show-offy, if that makes any sense. I was also joking throughout reading this in our group chat that maybe the reason that this is hitting me a lot more this time around than it was when I first read it three years ago is maybe because I'm starting to notice aging in myself. You know, when I originally read Dorian Gray, I was a mere 23 year old. I'm now 26. And when I do this, I get lines. That, that never used to happen. Like clearly I can relate to this book. <laughs> but I'm not sure that I would go to the same kind of lengths as Dorian to reverse that. No, all jokes aside, I thought this was absolutely stunning. It's been bumped up from a four star to a five star. Definitely one of my favourite classics that I've read. And then finally, the last book that I'm going to talk to you about today is Ask a Historian, 50 Surprising Answers to Things You Always Wanted to Know by Greg Jenner. This was one of my most anticipated books of this year, and I am so, so glad that I read this. I think you knew that I was going to be highly recommending this regardless, but I do really think if you are somebody who's wanting to get into history, if you're wanting to read a little bit Bit more historical and non-fiction, then this is definitely a really great starting point. What I like about his writing style is that it's very unpretentious, it's very casual, you do kind of feel when you're reading this like you are just, you know, sitting with a friend, you know, your friend who's just really really into history and wants to guide you through it, but without being patronising and trying to make it as fun as possible for you. There's a lot of fun pop culture references in here, there's a lot of really funny anecdotes. Questions in here include things such as, when was the first joke book written? How did women manage their periods before the 20th century? Did European people really eat ground up mummies? Who was the first vegetarian? Who names historical periods? And what will future historians call us? And one of my favourites, how much horse faeces and urine were created per day in London during the reign of Henry VIII? And what was done with it all? Among many, many others. Another book that I had a really, really great time reading. And I hope lots of people pick this up. I hope that for a lot of people, this can be a really engaging, fun way into history. The questions in here span from prehistory all the way into the modern day. So I feel like there's something for everyone. And I really highly recommend this one. So there we go. Those are all of the books that I read in the second half of November. Do let me know if you've read any of the books that I've spoken about today and let me know about any books that you have read. I'd love to hear from you. I hope you're having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks. Bye!